61 Omnibus with the leading American novelist Don DeLillo, who explores the idea that constant grave news coverage by the media may have replaced the novel as the tragic narrative of today. By their very nature, some of the scenes used to illustrate the theory effectively could be found distressing. Don DeLillo writes dangerous fiction. He's been called America's leading contemporary novelist, and his ten novels come directly out of the flow of recent history. The Kennedy assassination, toxic fallout, acts of terrorism. These are all part of the running picture of news against which his books are set. This film was developed in close collaboration with DeLillo. He wanted to use the documentary form to explore the relationships between gunmen and the novelist words and images, the power of news, and our obsession with apocalypse. In doing so, he asks, what effect can a novelist have on a culture in which terrorists seem to have hijacked the world's narrative? This was the year he rode the subway to the ends of the city, 200 miles of track. He liked to stand at the front of the first car, hands flat against the glass. The train smashed through the dark. People stood on local platforms staring nowhere a look they'd been practicing for years. He kind of wondered, speeding past, who they really were. His body fluttered in the fastest stretches. They went so fast, sometimes he thought they were on the edge of no control. Isolation, solitude, secret plotting. A novel is a secret a writer may keep for years before he lets it out of his room. Writers in hiding, writers in prison. Sometimes their secrets turn out to be dangerous to the state machine. For most writers in the West, of course, this danger is extremely remote. The cells we live in are strictly personal constructions. Let's change the room slightly and imagine another kind of apartness. The outsider who builds a plot around his desperation. A self-watcher. A lonely young man, living in a fiction he hasn't bothered to put down on paper. But this doesn't mean he isn't organized. He organizes everything. This is how he keeps from disappearing. His head is filled with dangerous secrets. And he may finally devise a way to come out of his room. He invents a false name, orders a gun through the mail, then looks around for someone famous he can shoot. Plots carry their own logic. There's a tendency of plots to move toward death. He believed that the idea of death is woven into the nature of every plot. A narrative plot no less than a conspiracy of armed men. The tighter the plot of a story, the more likely it will come to death. And now the sugar tape is beginning to flow from the windows uh, all over the uh, large uh, building here. and. Uh, Engulf the entire motorcade. And the crowd is absolutely going wild. This is a friendly crowd in downtown Dallas. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. There has been a shooting. I repeat, a shooting in the motorcade in the downtown area. 
For me, the assassination of President Kennedy was a rumble that gathered momentum over the years. It's present in my early work here and there. My first novel ends in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, the main character retracing the motorcade route in his rented car. I think it's true that none of my novels could have been written in the world that existed before the assassination. In my fiction, there seems to be a sense of danger everywhere, of something unraveling. We can't say who has been hit, if anybody has been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. When Kennedy was shot, something changed forever in America. Something opened up, a sense of randomness, deep ambiguity. We lost the narrative thread. Put me on, Phil. Put me on. Phil, am I on? See, this is what happened. The assassination left an emptiness that made everything plausible, made us susceptible to the most incredible ideas and fantasies. The policeman says, no, you cannot come in here. You cannot come in here. We'll let nobody else in. It was definitely the president's car. We couldn't seem to find out what happened even on the most basic level. How many gunmen, how many shots, how many wounds on the president's body. There was no coherent reality we could analyze and study. So we became a little paranoid. We developed a sense of the secret manipulation of history. You know, there's something they aren't telling us. Documents lost or destroyed, official records sealed for 50 years, a number of very suspicious murders and suicides. Since Dallas, we see conspiracy everywhere. Before it happened, we were much more self-assured. I think we felt specially blessed. I'm confident. As I look uh, to the future, that our chances for security, our chances for peace, are better than they've been in the past. And the reason is because we're stronger. Maybe this was a fairy tale we told ourselves, but it seemed to work. And Kennedy himself was a sign of our specialness. Certainly, we had greater faith in government before he was killed. This faith was deeply damaged, not only by the official handling of the investigation, but by later revelations concerning JFK's own administration. So even the myth of a noble president shot down by some malcontent became a little difficult to sustain. Bad news everywhere. Finally, I thought I might just walk right into the middle of it, do a novel about the assassination. I thought I would try to provide the narrative we'd lost somewhere in the chaos. Not an explanation for every confused human motive and certainly not a denial of the chaos, but maybe some element of safety, a way out of the endless unknowing. If we can't find a solution, let's imagine one. Many things might possibly go wrong. The story had too many people, too many wandering lives and subplots and major themes, too many things feeding in. Bay of Pigs, the U2 incident, organized crime, civil rights. But finally, it was the characters who drew me in, not the characters I would create for Libra, which is my ninth novel, but the ones already there. All those lives that were part of the record. Rich, strange, and very often tortured lives. Not just the major faces, but characters at the edges and on the edge. Lonely, violent, deeply American lives. The accused assassin was my route into the book. I needed to find a voice for Lee Oswald. Mm -hmm. 
Oswald and I lived near each other in the Bronx in 1953. I was 16 at the time, he was 13, and I didn't know him, but I was certainly startled to find out about the connection. His mother, Marguerite, put him in the car, an old Dodge, and they drove all the way to New York from Texas because her oldest son was stationed at a military base nearby. Oswald was a, a lifelong expatriate, really. Louisiana, Texas, New York, Japan in the Marines, Moscow and Minsk as a defector. I don't think it's simplistic to say his life was defined by books and guns. He had trouble reading, but was clearly drawn to books filled out an application once and said he wanted to write short stories on contemporary American life. He'd go to the library and take out books he knew President Kennedy had read and liked. He read Mao Zedong because Kennedy had. He read Ian Fleming. He went to the library to get the White Nile because he knew Kennedy had read it, but it was out. He got the Blue Nile instead. And he ended up in the Texas School Book Depository, a rifle in his hands, books all around him. Full name is Lee Harvey Oswald, O-S-W-A-L-D. Was he a lone gunman or one element in a conspiracy? Okay. Here comes Oswald down the hall again. You fire that rifle. Just as fast as you people have been getting, but I emphatically deny these charges. When I wrote from his viewpoint, I wanted a language that seemed endangered, a little jumpy. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. A language unsure of itself. He was a scattered man trying to put himself together. Two kinds of solitaries, plotting. The novelist wants to reveal consciousness, examine human possibility. The novelist is the natural defender of the self. Each writer is his own language. I think it's possible to say a novelist builds himself word by word. He needs ego, self-confidence, a certain vanity and arrogance to risk two or three or ten years on a book. A secure sense of himself. The lone, disaffected gunman is probably living on the edge of selfhood. Dangling, thin boundary, not fully formed. His own fictions, his plots, schemes, his fantasies tend to narrow the world, reduce the world, in some cases, to two people. Just him in his sixth floor perch and the charismatic leader riding by in the blue limousine. President Kennedy went to Texas Lee and his Russian wife, a young woman who'd envisioned the consumer paradise and ended up getting slapped around by her underpaid and sometimes out-of-work husband. Lee could not provide. Makes you lonely not to have the things you see around you all the time. Keeps you from being whole. And what about the man who's privileged? It isn't his money or high office or beautiful wife. It's that electronic glow he emits, that inspired gift or power. The way he rides through the lights, looking just like his photographs. As things got worse for Lee, he began to see himself in the president. His life by this time was unraveling. I think he'd wandered outside history and into fantasy, into coincidence. Look, nice and steady, just like you wanted it. 
The first movie was suddenly. Frank Sinatra is a combat veteran who comes to a small town and takes over a house that overlooks the railway depot. He is here to assassinate the president. Trap. Big, beautiful booby trap. You can't do this. You can't do it. Take a look. Lee felt a stillness around him. He had an eerie sense he was being watched for his reaction. He felt connected to the events on the screen. It was like secret instructions entering the network of signals and broadcast bands, the whole busy air of transmission. I can do it, and I'm going to do it. You'll never get away with it. Shut up. Marina was asleep. They were running a message through the night into his skin. The streets were dark. The house was dark, except for the flickering screen, an old scratchy film that carried his dreams. Perfection of rage, perfection of control, the fantasy of night. Lee felt that he was in the middle of his own movie. They were running this thing just for him. Yeah. Yeah, I've never killed a president before. Just a moment. Just a moment. We have a bulletin coming in. We now switch you directly to Parkland Hospital and KBOX News Director Bill Hampton. I have just talked to Father Oscar Hubert of the Holy Trinity Catholic Church. He and another priest tell me that the pair of men have just administered the last rites of the Catholic Church to President Kennedy. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The president is dead. The president of the United States is dead. So the awful thing happened, and it happened on film. The assassination is a home movie called the Zapruder film after the Dallas dress manufacturer who took his 8mm camera to Dealey Plaza. 18 seconds of Zapruder. There are serious students of these 18 seconds, of course. Every blur has been analyzed. There's a technique called blur analysis. Our most photogenic president dying on film. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think the footage comes close to uncovering some secret about the nature of film itself. Film carries something, some mind stream some myth that may be common to us all. It's as though the experience of film has acquired a kind of independent existence in our consciousness. It's that deeply embedded. Have to get it on film. frontiers we cross are the infinitely large and the incredibly small. What we can see and what we can only imagine. Film is more than the 20th century art. It's another part of the 20th century mind. The 20th century is on film. It's the film century. If a thing can be filmed, film is implied in the thing itself.
people with wasting diseases allowing themselves to be filmed as they die. People committing suicide on film. Satellite cameras reading your license plate from 300 miles up. This is CNN Headline News. Cameras in the uterus. Cameras dangling over the doors in every public space we enter. Watching ourselves. Constantly being watched. Images follow us everywhere. Come into our rooms, drive with us in the car, come into our beds and help mediate our sex lives. Film creates a kind of dreaming space all of us occupy. When I was a teenager, I saw Bert in From Here to Eternity. He stood above Deborah Carr on that Hawaiian beach, and for the first time in my life, I felt the true power of the image. Bert was like a city in which we were all living. He was that big. Within the conflux of shadow and time, there was room for all of us, and I knew I must extend myself until the molecules parted and I was spliced into the image. I never knew it could be like this. Nobody ever kissed me the way you do. Nobody? In my first no. novel, Americana, the hero lives a kind of third-person existence as an ideal figure made up of images, media messages. He's image-haunted. He constantly reinvents himself through film and television, from the person he is to the person he would be. This is what Media America promises, access to our desires, to our invented selves. Images mix with reality. They replace reality sometimes. Think of those young men, media poisoned men who believe that electronic images contain some element of healing magic, who feel deprived of spiritual sustenance and who try to find their destiny not through religious vocation or high adventure or even somewhere in the alignment of the stars, but through the media, the information grids, as if orbiting satellites contain the true message of who you are and what you must do. Imagine standing on that cold plain a thousand years before the pyramids, alone at that distant dawn. How terrifying the world must have been. And how we responded to the night storm with the dawn of technology. For me, as the writer of novels which, to some extent, find the soul of the culture in filmed images, Oswald is a kind of hinge between the committed political assassin and the lonely moviegoer and TV watcher, the celebrity stalker. Stalking a victim is a way of organizing one's loneliness, making a network out of it, a system of connections. Arthur Bremer. Nobody remembers Arthur Bremer, the funny, faceless kid who shot Governor Wallace in a shopping center. Where else? <laughs> Arthur Bremer was moved toward this act when he saw the movie Clockwork Orange. Bremer's diary was published, 
and provided inspiration for the movie Taxi Driver. John Hinckley went to see Taxi Driver and fell in love with a young actress, Jodie Foster. He thought, I will impress her by shooting the President of the United States, the old actor Ronald Reagan. The years have taught us to feel the terrible chill of random violence, senseless murders, crimes of self-publicity. There's a kind of soft, dreamy, existential violence that is meant essentially to bolster the faltering self of the gunman. Terrorists, be on notice. We will fight back against you in Lebanon and elsewhere. We will fight back to stamp out this ugly, vicious evil of terrorism. With widespread political terrorism, we got our narrative back. Calculated acts, not random. <laughs> Stories played out over days and weeks, played out over years when there are hostages involved. A narrative that horrifies for many reasons, one of them the fact that they're killing people for its publicity value. They are beating the passengers, they are beating the passengers, they are threatening to kill them now. They are threatening to kill them now, we want the fuel now, immediately. The explosion came just before three o'clock. Most of the residents were asleep. Some were still socializing in the bars as the hotel was ripped apart. They are about to shoot a passenger, two to a eight four seven. They are not at the radio, they're about to shoot a passenger. They just shot a passenger, two to a eight four seven. The cockpit of Pan Am's made of the seas nose down now in the soft air. Terrorists were responsible for the explosion. The aircraft came out of the Pan sky, Am's trailing flames, scattering wreckage, Scotland. fuel, and passengers. And the awful genius of terrorism is that it affects the daily lives of ordinary people. We don't have to be famous or gifted or powerful. We're all potential victims. We're all class enemies. And this shift in the culture was something I wanted to understand. curious knot that binds novelists and terrorists. In the West, we become famous effigies as our books lose the power to shape and influence. Do you ask your writers how they feel about this? Years ago, I used to think it was possible for novelists to alter the life of the culture, but now bomb makers and gunmen have taken over that territory. They make raids on human consciousness. Mm. What writers used to do before we were all incorporated Keep going. I like your anger. But you know all this. This is why you travel a million miles photographing writers, because we have given way to terror, to news of terror. News of disaster is the only narrative people need. The darker the news, the grander the narrative. News is the final addiction before what? what? <laughs> I don't know. But you're smart to trap us in your camera before we disappear. The novel, Mao Too, is about a reclusive writer who escapes the failed novel he's been working on for many years. He abandons the book and enters the world. It turns out to be the world of political violence. We have novelists and terrorists, words and images. We have crowds everywhere, masses of people in the streets, on television, in stadiums, in great public squares, crowds of revolutionaries, crowds of mourners. And the novel, in a way, wonders who is speaking to these people. Has the writer lost the ability to shape the way we see and feel? Has he lost his adversarial role? Is the novelist part of the background noise now? 
part of the buzz of celebrity and consumerism? You have a twisted sense of the writer's place in society. You think the writer belongs at the far margin, doing dangerous things. Now, the most successful writers make the biggest complainers. The solitude is killing. The nights are sleepless. The days are taught with worry and pain. Bemoan, bemoan. Well, it must be hard for you dealing with these wretches day after day. Ah, it's easy. I take them to a major eatery. I tell them their books are doing splendidly in the chains. Yeah, I recommend the roast monkfish with Savoy cabbage. I tell them the reprint bidders are howling at the commodity pits. There is mini-series interest. There is audio cassette interest. The White House wants a copy for the den. I say the publicity people are setting up tours. The Italians love the book completely. The Germans are groping for new levels of rapture. Oh my, oh my, oh my. And yourself, Charlie? I'm adjusting to the new style. The title, Mao Too, comes from a likeness of Chairman Mao by Andy Warhol. Warhol did many pictures of Mao, and his silk screens have the effect of floating the image free of history, so that the man steeped in bloody wars and revolutions becomes something else completely, a kind of sacred figure on a painted surface, and not very different at all from Warhol's Marilyn or Elvis. And what about the novelist? Has he lost his original face? I think everything we do in the West is so readily absorbed by the culture that it's very difficult for works of art to become dangerous. The culture works in such a way that it has a reflex that enables it to absorb danger as soon as it appears. We're alone in a room involved in this mysterious exchange. What am I giving up to you? And what are you investing me with? Or stealing from me? How are you changing me? I can feel the change like some current just under the skin. Are you making me up as you go along? Am I mimicking myself? I've become someone's material. Yours, Brita. There's the life, and there's the consumer event. Everything around us tends to channel our lives towards some final reality in print or on film. Everything seeks its own heightened version. Or, put it this way, nothing happens until it's consumed. Nature has given way to aura. All the material in every life is channeled into the glow. Here I am in your lens, and already I see myself differently, twice over, or once removed. Mao too began with two photographs. For a long time, I had no idea they were connected. I saw the first picture in April 1988, I think it was, front page of the tabloid New York Post. An elderly man with a look on his face of desperate shock and rage. The man is a writer, J.D. Salinger, famous, of course, for Catcher in the Rye. And the camera belonged to two people sent by the Post to find and photograph him. First picture of Salinger since 1955. I didn't know why, but I saved this photograph. About six months later, I came across a small, grainy photo in the morning paper. The mass wedding conducted by Reverend Sun Young Moon of the Unification Church. I saved this picture, too. And eventually, I would begin to think of the novel I was writing as an attempt to understand the connection between these two photographs. The arch-individualist, the solitary writer living outside the blur and the waste of endless images. But they found him. They got him. Ordering a photograph of a famous recluse must be a little like ordering an execution. 
Salinger resembles a man who's fighting for his life. And the regimented crowd learning to dress alike and think alike, brides and grooms actually matched by photograph, willing to surrender months and years of love and courtship to one moment that looks completely surreal to me, a little like a rehearsal for the end of the world. something about vast crowds, great masses of people assembled around the enormous image of some dictator or holy man that may make us wonder about the end of individuality. There's a primal terror in crowds, a sense of all control gone, all distinctions gone. Crowds speak a half language, a language of rote and repetition, chanted slogans, a single chanted name over and over. Think of crowds on television. The intimate little screen can give us a sense of millennium, of a messianic future. Each viewer his own apocalypse. Crowds are terrifying, but maybe beautiful in a way as well. We desire at times to lose ourselves in the crowd, dress identically, be carried along, burn away all the pain and anxiety of self and the struggle to be who we are. The crowd grew and clamored, and the body had to be transported to the cemetery by helicopter. There were aerial shots of the burial site surrounded by crowds. Karen thought they were like pictures of a thousand years ago, some great city falling clamorously to siege. Then the helicopter landed, and the crowds broke through the barriers. The living were trying to bring the dead man back among them. Karen could not imagine who else was watching this. It could not be real if others watched. If other people watched, if millions watched, if these millions matched the numbers on the Iranian plane, doesn't it mean we share something with the mourners? Know an anguish? Feel something pass between us? Hear the sigh of some historic grief? She turned and saw Brita leaning back on the far arm of the sofa, calmly smoking. This is the woman who talked about needing people to believe for her seeing people bleed for their faith. And she is calmly sitting in this frenzy of a nation and a race. If others saw these pictures, why has nothing changed? Where are the local crowds? Why do we still have names and addresses and car keys?
hours this morning, southern Britain. Six hours this morning, southern Britain. For six hours this morning, American planes had a devastating attack on the enemy. The lead story on tonight's news. An image that defies commentary. A three-year-old girl, her body limp and passed from hand to hand. Not so long ago, I think it was possible for a novelist to think that he might influence the consciousness of his time. Today, it's news that has begun to influence the way we see the world. It's news that has become so extraordinarily dominant. I think we've come to depend on news. The darker, the better. In a way, we need it, because it is the tragic narrative of our time. Tragedy at Hillsborough, England, as Inside stands the were ground, the trouble at developed place. slowly at first, belying the tragedy that was Tragedy at Hillsborough, England. A classic horror a classic of a huge horror crowd, of a dense of crowd, out of control space. in a confined space, was setting in. They came in from the ocean. They came in from the ocean. There's been chaos and near panic in the world's major cities. Now the news has seen in such numbers in this part of Africa. Chinese students hurled stones at tanks in Tiananmen Square tonight. The Chinese authorities continue to deny the avenue of eternal peace. Came an armored personnel carrier, lumbered along like an animal among hunters. I keep thinking without too much supporting evidence that images have something to do with crowds. An image is a crowd in a way, a smear of impressions. Images tend to draw people together, create mass identity. Words, words in books seem connected to the development of self. The book fits the individual reader. The shape and nature of the book lines of print, the linear progression of alphabetic marks on the page, here's a single mind developing, finding its own distinctive shape and nature. Every sentence has a truth waiting at the end of it, and the writer learns how to know it when he finally gets there. On one level, this truth is the swing of the sentence, the beat and poise. But deeper down, it's the integrity of the writer as he matches the language. I've always seen myself in sentences. I begin to recognize myself word by word as I work through a sentence. The language of my books has shaped me as a man. There's a moral force in a sentence when it comes out right. It speaks of the writer's will to live. I've worked the sentences of this book long and hard, but not long and hard enough, because I can no longer see myself in the language. The running picture is gone, the code of being that pushed me on and made me trust the world. This book and these years have worn me down. I've forgotten what it means to write, forgotten my own first rule. Keep it simple, Bill. Whatever the crowd is or represents, the writer can't afford to stand apart from it. I saw an entry recently in the journals of John Cheever, and he was writing about an evening he spent in a baseball stadium and a glimpse he had of hundreds of people reaching for a baseball hit into the grandstand. And he said it's not the writer's task to describe the thoughts of an adulterous woman looking out a window at streaks of rain running down the glass. 
We need to understand those 400 people reaching for the baseball, those 10 or 20,000 people heading for the exits as the ball game ends. Moral judgments, Cheever said, embodied in a migratory vastness. So the writer is in history, fully engaged in contemporary life, connected to the turmoil, the clash of voices. Do you know why I believe in the novel? It's a democratic shout. Anybody can write a great novel. One great novel. Almost any amateur off the street. I believe this. Some nameless drudge, some desperado with barely a nurtured dream can sit down and find his voice and luck out and do it. Something so angelic it makes your jaw hang open. The spray of talent, the spray of ideas. One thing unlike another, one voice unlike the rest. Ambiguities, contradictions, whispers, hints. With the crowds gone, the city is abandoned to its images. Empty, lonely, and beautiful in a way. Beautifully forlorn. Words dangling in the sky, words as images. A fragmented language that's totally familiar to everyone, that doesn't need translating into Japanese or Spanish. Brand names, jingles, slogans, news flashes. Every kind of message to gather against the fear and loneliness of city life. It's all language. It's what a writer uses. There was something in Oswald's face, a glance at the camera before he was shot, that put him here in the audience, among the rest of us, sleepless in our homes. A glance, a way of telling us that he knows who we are and how we feel. Something in the look, some sly intelligence, exceedingly brief but far-reaching, a connection, all but bleached away by glare, tells us that he is outside the moment, watching with the rest of us. By contrast, all is grace and harmony in next week's omnibus in a profile of former Olympic ice dance champions Jane Torville and Christopher Dean, who have recently been pushing the parameters of ice dance to new limits of creativity and style. Oh. Oh.